Hello and welcome to DevSec Talks. I'm your host, Ashley Ward, and today I'm joined by Cheryl Hung, VP of Ecosystem for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We'll be diving into Cheryl's predictions for the future of cloud native security, her thoughts on the use cases for Kubernetes at the edge, and more. Let's get started, shall we? Thank you so much for inviting me, Ashley. Pleasure is all mine. Why don't you take us through those top, those 10 predictions? Yeah, of course. So just to give a little bit of background about where these predictions come from and what my role is within CNCF. So I prim primarily look after the end user community. These are companies that are adopting cloud native. Um, and I also work a lot with the different projects. So I get to see what are the new projects coming in and out of CNCF and what people are really looking at and looking at next. So these 10 predictions come from discussions that I've had with people, from things that I've read on social media and so on. Um, and I've divided them into three topics. So the first topic is kind of tech, broadly toolings, frameworks, that sort of thing. The second is DevOps, things related to people and processes. And then the third one is ecosystems. So things that are generally multiple organizations and yeah, just broader, broader business trends perhaps. So within tech, I put down four trends. The first is we're starting to see more and more projects using Rust as oh. a programming language. Um, so I'm sure people, most people know that Go is kind of the lingua yeah. franca anchor of cloud native. Um, but we're starting to see more and more Rust projects starting to use Rust, which I haven't used much myself, but I've heard very good things about it. Yeah, I, I, without going into a lot of detail on it, is, is there, have you seen why that trend is case? I don't know exactly why this trend is right now. It's just, yeah. it's just from seeing, yeah. No, it's really, it's really fun. Years ago. And I've, I've yeah, seen, yeah. I know that like the work you've done with the radar that you've seen, I know that you've got that visibility across those different projects that are coming in. So that's that's really interesting. Okay, carry on now. <laughs> so that's the first one. The second one is about cross cloud um, becoming more real, being a little bit hesitant here because I think multi-cloud is always this, you know, big idea at the beginning that hasn't quite played out in that way. Um, so what I'm seeing there is that multi-cloud so not talking hybrid cloud i feel hybrid cloud is becoming you know pretty feasible now a lot of companies are doing a mixture of on-prem and cloud but uh, on-prem and a public cloud but cross cloud going across multiple clouds is possible for stateless applications but the data and the storage is still a really big challenge uh, that's that's something so this is something that i talk to a lot of people about quite often and Typically, if I'm speaking to an engineering community, they all say single cloud or, or Corey Quinn's always good fun when he's he's quite <laughs> adamant about that and says that. But and, and so they say, you know, single cloud. But every time I speak to anyone on more of the business side, they, they typically have been bitten by by nasty vendors like me, but they've been bitten in the past at some point. And so they, they want to be able to either go the multi cloud or at least have a defined exit strategy. As I, think, well. I think it's getting there, maybe not this year, but it's trending in that direction. Um, the third one is there's a couple of new technologies, new-ish technologies, which are starting to become more widespread. So I named WebAssembly and eBPF in particular about as now that they're becoming more widespread, there are more cloud native projects which are using these technologies to extend the different environments where you can run containers and Kubernetes. Again, it's a very early trend. There is, I, I, it's, I think it's really, really exciting. I mean, even just from the, the, the what you're able to do with EBPF is, uh, EB, yeah, is, is that, uh, you know, even doing, using TCP, it's like a TCP dump or, or an S trace if you want to do it for analyzing those kernel calls on the one hand, but then it's also can be used for a whole load of different things for, for going right into even, even uh, you know, sandboxing and, and virtual machines. It's a really exciting uh, bit of technology. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be keeping an eye on it going forward anyway. <laughs> Excellent. So the fourth one is Kubernetes on the edge. So in this one, 
This is again kind of expanding the different environments where you can run Kubernetes and containers. And in particular, the moving towards moving away from big centralized data centers and doing more compute at the edge. So closer to where the users are and maybe even devices that users are using themselves and all the tooling around that that enables. I'm not going to say anything about that because I want to go into more detail on it in, in a minute. We'll do that two. in a moment. Um, okay, so those are the four tech trends. Um, let's switch to DevOps, people, processes, teams. Um, the first trend that I've seen coming up here is GitOps. GitOps kind of famously started by uh, kind of really promoted by Alexis Richardson from Weaveworks is this idea that you can make all of your infrastructure declarative, store all of that within Git, and then use software agents to update the live running clusters from those specifications. So I'm quite excited by this. I think there's we've got some new working groups coming up around GitOps. And yeah, it's just, it's I've seen a lot of benefits from it. It's something that in all honesty, through I can trace back almost my entire career has been about trying to to do infrastructure in that way, coming from an infrastructure background. And you know, the old the saying, you know, if it's if it's not in version control, it doesn't exist. And then there, there'd be little gaps that would, you know, it's, it's always been an ongoing struggle. But I think things are really coming together now to to actually deliver this. Again, that is the other subject I want to dive into more detail with, um, uh, maybe in another call. <laughs> anyway, carry on with your DevOps okay. prediction. Okay, excellent. Um, the sixth prediction is around chaos engineering. Kind of first started, first really popularized via Chaos Monkey through Netflix. Um, this is about making your infrastructure more resilient by kind of pushing a little, putting a little bit of stress and a bit of pressure on it and measuring the outcomes. Um, there's been a lot of tooling and framework tooling around this for a few years now. And we're starting to see a few companies within cloud native pick up on this as well. That's really exciting because it, it for a while, it's really scary, you know, and, and it's, but it's, it's so good. I spoke to someone who said, oh, we, you know, you'd never be allowed to do that in, in my company. And you go, well, that's not, that's not true. And, and if so, that means you really don't have faith in, in your production estate, which it's a difficult balance, but I think that's, it's really, really exciting. And it's something that's interesting to hear from you. Cause there's one thing me thinking, oh, that sounds really cool. Right. But it's another, you seeing people are right, coming together and, and coming out. That. Great. Yep. Absolutely. And um, it's in DevOps because chaos engineering is really a set of best practices. It's not just a single tool that you can use and set of forget. Okay, so seventh prediction was on the rise of FinOps. FinOps meaning financial kind of operations, figuring out cloud costs and managing the cost spending. We have a sister foundation underneath the Linux Foundation, which is called the FinOps Foundation. And they just look at exactly at this problem. So I think it's still fairly early stages, but there's definitely a recognition that managing cloud spending and figuring out how to, figuring out what your applications are really doing and what's really costing you and be able to optimize for that is something that pretty much every company that's moving into the cloud will look into at some point. Oh, very cool, very cool. Um, okay, on to the ecosystem. So these are broader kind of business and industry trends. Um, the first one is about pluggable developer and operator experiences. So what I'm thinking in particular here is a developer portal that was released from Spotify called Backstage. And the basic concept behind this is that there's so many tools out there, the user experience of these for a lot of them is honestly not great. So being able to have a singular de single developer portal and for that to be able to be pluggable so that you can use whatever tools and products within that same portal. Um, I think this is going to really improve the experience of cloud native and make it easier for people to start using it. Is that kind of like a, a service catalog, but instead of it being sort of for the corporate push down, it's actually a developer first service catalogs so and pick and choose the tools. Um, it's not 
just about the service catalog in the sense of being able to install it. It's also about being able to do the day-to-day -day management and maintenance through a portal. So for example, you could look at um, you could incorporate your cloud spending, your FinOps function directly into this developer portal so that you can see clearly, you know, that next to your, um, I don't know, how much storage you're using versus what are the, um, what, what do your Prometheus metrics tell you? Okay, so th th that's actually something that I need to have a look at because I've, I've, I've not, um, I just assumed it was a, a fancier service catalog, but that's obviously wrong. Cool. It's, it's not that it's wrong. I think that's part of it. But yeah, being able to do the day-to-day the -day maintenance through it as well um, is important. Okay, number nine is service mesh consolidation. Service meshes have been hot for a couple of years. There's been a few that are more popular than others. But just as Kubernetes if we think back, you know, four or five years ago, it was not obvious that Kubernetes was going to be the winner. There were multiple orchestrators out there and it feels like service mesh might be heading in that direction as well, where instead of having, you know, four or five different options, there might just be one that becomes standardized. And that makes sense because as people find out exactly what what's needed from each different and the different pros and cons and battle testing things, that's, I mean, the good thing is, I feel the good thing is, is that because CNCF is driving a lot of this, or, you know, the CNCF umbrella is there, is that it's that whole, well, let's make it from the off pluggable. Let's look at how we can have things where we've got, um, you know, interoperability and, and, and instead of, Instead of like the the orchestrator wars, where it was really kind of a lot of separate organisations who were trying to trying to do things. No, that's really cool. That's definitely one of the founding principles behind CNCF. You know, we want everything to be interoperable. We want new entrants to be able to come in, and we want to consolidate later on at the right time when it becomes clear who's winning and what's not. So, yeah, um, and I would say it's been pretty successful so far. Um, the last trend that I see, I've called end user driven open source. So these are companies like Netflix and Spotify that we've already mentioned, which are releasing open source projects and contributing towards open source projects to solve their own problems and are becoming leaders in the open source space. Um, I think this is quite interesting because classically as an end user, you, you just have an interest in using open source. Um, if you contribute back, it will probably be through a vendor. But now I think end users are starting to think, this is something quite valuable in its own right for, for us to be able to own that technical direction and have the expertise in-house. What I find really interesting about what that end user space for CNCF is that it's not, um, we say end user, but well, here's the question for you. It's not just, I presume it's not just that person, um, a, a single user, it's it's companies who are doing this. It's, it's, it's I'm not just, big like you've already mentioned people you would think are big open source consumers but i mean the commercial entities that are in manufacturing or, or across the board or is that 100%. the case yeah no 100 percent um there's think, definitely more corporate support for this as you said in the past it might have just been a single individual but now companies are realizing that hey developers actually want to contribute towards open source. It's good for them, it's good for the company, and the company should support that. Where would I go to find out more information about uh, being an end user? Best place to go would be cncf.io slash end user. So literally that, um, come and join our end user community. We have more than 145 companies, including all the big names that you might think of, uh, including Apple, you know, just some really huge names who are all interested in sharing how they're deploying cloud native what are the challenges they've run into um, how can they collectively fix these and provide feedback and yeah it's just it's a really great community so definitely come and check it out So if we're able to, or if you're happy to, let's talk about Kubernetes for the edge. Absolutely. All right. So first of all, when we're talking about edge and Kubernetes for the edge, what are we talking about, Cheryl? So I see it as three more or less distinct layers. 
So the centralized data centers, which are, you know, probably a thousand kilometers away from the, the user, it's so the furthest apart. That's kind of where, mostly where we are today. So that's not edge. Getting a little bit closer, we have the service providers, the telecoms, edge. So that's probably 25 to 100 kilometers away. And then the user edge is things like um, anywhere down to embedded devices, cell phones, um, anything that's kind of less than 25 kilometers from the user. So when we talk about edge, we talk about generally the user edge and the service provider edge. Um, are, would you say that actually you're looking at saying there's that, but then also running containers and uh, actually on end devices at, at some point? I think that would definitely be included. Um, so what you mentioned is totally correct. Like quite a, quite a lot of restaurants will run, you know, a three node Kubernetes cluster for every single restaurant, which I think is super cool and just amazing. Um, but then you can get all the way down to, you know, yeah, can my cell phone run Kubernetes? Can my smart fridge or my smart TV run, you know, maybe not Kubernetes, but, or maybe some stripped down version of Kubernetes, but at least run containers. Chick-fil-A did a talk and uh, it was AWS and, and someone from Chick-fil-A. You, you will be able to find it on YouTube because I found it on YouTube and it will be with the CNCF um, YouTube uh, channel. But. It, that level of compute seems like overkill a little bit in a lot of situations. Are you seeing, I mean, you know, I've probably spoiled what you're going to say by mentioning that talk, but they, uh, are, you, are you seeing similar things? Are you seeing people actually doing this in anger? I would say that it's not widespread at the moment, but it's a really huge area of interest to the telecoms industry. And once this becomes, once they start providing the infrastructure for this, then you'll start to see more applications that are being built to use this paradigm because there's some benefits to it for sure. The fact that you can be much closer to the user means you get a really fast user response. You know, you're not waiting for that round trip to a data center and back again. Um, it means that you can have you know, billions of devices running compute as opposed to, you know, in a data center where you have thousands. So you can make better use of that compute power. So the infrastructure is kind of getting there. And then I think in a few more years time, you'll see more applications. To me, of course, having spent a lot of my career trying to shift people into the cloud, um, it now does feel like maybe we're trying to pull things. Are we going to have these everything's under someone's desk now? Is, the, is it no, no longer are we having data centers? We'll have just personalized data centers. <laughs> I think no, far, far from it. I think this isn't about getting rid of data centers. It's about making sure the compute is at the most appropriate place so you get the best experience out of it. So in many use cases, centralized data centers is going to be absolutely fine. You do not need more than that. But in other cases, there'll be benefits to running closer to the users. And for that, yeah, we'll, we'll have this infrastructure, infrastructure, this edge infrastructure, which will make it possible. The first thing that springs to mind is if someone's got physical access to something, then it's, it's uh, null and void almost. What I mean, what type of things are, do you think is going to happen there? Are we going to see new things come along that will help with that? Or, you know, what's your take on that? I think that this is still being worked through, the answer to this. Um, I haven't seen a kind of settled solution or best practices around this at the moment. So, yeah, I think the security side of it is still very early days. Well, and that's where it, it makes it's the same as everything, isn't it? We, we need to. You don't want to do everything up front. You want to see if something works or not. And then we we've already talked about that in other contexts there as well. But you want to see if something's going to be uh, going to be a gore before uh, before you have to really worry about the plumbing around it. No, that's it, that's good. Now, uh, my nasty nasty question is coming up now. One of the bits of criticism that gets levelled at Kubernetes by a number of different people is that it's complexity for uh, it's more, too much complexity for most people now i ran 
platforms. I'm a big fan, so that's where I'm actually on site and don't think it's true. But with my angry face and, and pointy hand, <laughs> you know, Kubernetes is too complicated. Isn't this just overkill? Um, I would argue that it is a complicated problem. It just genuinely is complicated. I mean, especially when we're talking about edge, as you said, you no longer have the physical control over the devices. So your control is reduced. Your devices are very constrained. They have limited connectivity. You'll get delays and disconnections. This is genuinely a difficult problem. I would argue that Kubernetes makes that easier, if anything. Um, but if you still want all of the, the benefits of cloud native, so the reliability, the scalability, being able to push images to, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of devices ease of devices quickly, then I think Kubernetes makes that easier. As you say, it's a complex problem and, and it's really about, it's, it's not about how, well, for me, it was, the, you were instead trying to make, take complexity away from some people and have that as part of it. So if that means that someone doesn't need to worry about infrastructure and can instead just deploy services, yes, of course, somebody still needs to worry about the infrastructure and then, and, but that's for the orchestrators there. So as an operations guy, I can worry about having a, a platform that works and I don't need to have endless conversations with people who are producing good things about why it's important to have storage or what a file system needs to look like. So yeah, I completely, completely agree. I found the note. And as a, sorry, as a uh, application developer by background, I have to express my appreciation for infrastructure and ops people for providing this because a lot of the time I don't want to think about the infrastructure. To me, it's a distraction, you know? I want to focus on shipping new features and fix and bug fixes. So the less I have to think about that, the better it is for me. Thank you to Cheryl Hung for taking the time to sit down with us today. And thank you for tuning in to episode one of DevSec Talks. Visit the link in the description below for more details on this series. And be sure to subscribe and turn on channel notifications to be the first to know about our upcoming episodes. And if you're interested in being part of our DevSec Talk series, or if you have any topics you'd like to hear more of, let us know in the comments section below. I'll see you next time.